Change your heart, change your life, change the planet. Hey everybody, it's Tim Van Orden. And I wanted to do another follow-up to my, what I've learned in 20 years eating a vegan diet. Uh, it's been a week since I made that first video, or maybe a little over a week. It's April 19th today. And you can see that it's a beautiful spring day here in Woodford. And I'm out doing a boot slog. And the reason that I wanted to make this video today is that the comments on that video uh, continually surprise me and yet they don't. And one of the things that consistently shows up whenever you put out a video about eating a plant-based diet that becomes popular, as that video has recently, you get what most would consider the troll armies descending on the comment section. And you just get one after another after another uh, making ad hominem attacks or ideological uh, statements about how I look or how inferior or dangerous the diet is. For instance, dude, you look emaciated you're unhealthy, or they don't talk to me, they talk about me saying, his cheekbones, they're sunken, his eyes are sunken, he's so pale. That one baffles me the most because everybody's like, dude, where'd you go? Your tan is crazy, because I'm outside every day. Anyway, the comments just keep coming, and none of them are based in any objective reality or empirical fact uh, or field of observable facts. Uh, they're just people that want to slam a video or attack a particular person and try to discredit that person. They're not interested in truth. They're not interested in a conversation. They're not interested in anything other than attacking uh, the diet, the person, or the video because it's getting a lot of attention. So why am I bringing this up? It's really easy to feel like you need to protect a vegan diet or you need to protect me, because that's often what happens is that people will attack the attacker to try to defend me. And this tribalism will often come up in this, this need to fight back, this need to punish, a need to dominate. And I have that in me. I get reactive. Um, I'm human. I have a mammalian brain wrapped in a primate brain coated with the thin icing of human brain, and they all work together seamlessly. Uh, they're all deeply interconnected. Uh, no one is in charge. Uh, so it's common to have that reaction to their reactions. And most of the comments are incredibly ignorant. And it's, it's hard to be in a world where you see ignorance as the leading cause of suffering. Not violence, but ignorance, which usually leads to violence. Violence just doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it's often propped up by ignorance. So my goal to be more compassionate, uh, my goal to help share uh, what I've learned about compassion and to engage compassionately in the world in the midst of challenge, like right now running in my heavy boots in the snow. Uh, gonna get about 10 miles today. And that's a choice I make, but I also recognize that that's a choice that most people will never make and have no interest in making. So, I can work on me, 
and I can share. But that doesn't mean that what I do is going to change anything. Uh, and it, and that's okay. Uh, I don't do this with the result in mind. And that's part of compassion, is that you do it with the process in mind. You do it with the moment in mind. You do it with whatever it is that you're swimming in, in mind. You don't say that that sea of suffering doesn't exist. You say, let me jump in with you. Oh, wow, yeah, you're right. All right, let's swim to the other side. Uh, let's work with it. Let's move through it. I'm here. And because I practice in places like this, because I, I practice in discomfort on a regular basis, I can help you. I can guide you because I know how to work through stuff like this. And, but that doesn't mean anything's going to change. And I've learned this as a coach, that you come out swinging and in the beginning, hey, I'm going to transform your life by helping you transition to a raw vegan diet. You're going to lose weight, you're going to cure every illness, and your life is going to be magically transformed, and your depression is just going to vanish. Or let me help you lose weight by putting you on a fitness program. Let me help you get faster. And I've got all the answers. It's simple. Just plug yourself into this equation that I'm going to give you. And now that I've been coaching people for 10 years, I realize it's not that simple. My knowledge base has grown ridiculously large. And the tools that I use have been refined and refined and tested and tested and, and broken and rebuilt. And my education just never stops. And, and I'm a much, much, much better coach. Far more effective. And yet, I realize that people don't change easily. So, you focus on the process. You make a commitment. First, I make a commitment to myself to put myself in the midst of challenge and to practice being compassionate. A few moments before I made this video, I, I was really dragging. I was like, oh my God. Uh, I just want to stop. I want to turn around and, and walk home. And I worked with those voices. I, I was gentle with them. I was compassionate with them. I allowed them to be there and continued moving my body and, and started exploring other aspects of my being, other aspects of my sensory input and the world around me. And suddenly those feelings quieted down. I didn't deny them. I didn't shame them. I didn't yell at them. I didn't tough it up. I said, oh, okay, I hear that. I feel that. That's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on a walk. You don't have to do this anymore. I'll do it for you. So here, just come up on my shoulder and I'll carry you the rest of the way. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm carrying that part of me. And that part of me isn't complaining anymore. It's happy. It's like, oh, what a beautiful day to be in the wilderness. So my first commitment is always to me to put myself in challenge and practice being compassionate. Then my second commitment is to others. Okay, there are people that are suffering. Do I walk away from them? Do I ignore them? Because it's going to screw up my schedule. It's going to ruin my vibe, man. You're going to burst my balloon. You're going to rain on my parade. Or do I move into their midst and don't try to fix it? And don't try to change it, but simply model that it's okay to be okay in the midst of it. And that it's possible to take steps calmly in the midst of it. I'll show you. I'll do that next to you. And I'll help you take your steps and maybe we can move out of this together. Uh, but I'm not going to fix you. I'm not going to make you wrong. I'm just going to work next to you and model compassion next to you. Uh, but not be righteous about it. But really be humble in that process. Because it hurts what you're going through. It really does hurt. And I, uh, I get that. I feel that a lot. So, 
That's the goal, that's the process. So how that relates to these comments. These are human beings leaving these comments. They're not trolls. It's not a troll army. It's not meat eaters. They're humans. And we're all humans, I think. Until genetic tests prove otherwise. Pretty sure right now that we're all still humans. And we all go through this. We all go through uh, wanting to protect. We all go through needing to feel right. We all go through uh, needing significance and, and being scared to death of uncertainty, being scared to death of, of disease or violence and, and needing to feel that we have something that's true, something that we can hold on to, something that gives our lives meaning, gives them significance, gives us significance and makes us feel like we have a, a through line, that we have a path, we have a direction and all we have to do is move in that direction and everything's going to be okay. And this is a built-in feature of the human brain. It's why human beings are religious. It's why human beings are tribal. Uh, it's, it's why f factions within the vegan community fight with each other. It's why so-called carnists and so-called vegans fight with each other. Because each has found something that has given them meaning, has given them strength, has given them a way to put their life into perspective and a way to frame whatever challenges they may have had and to explain or flatten those challenges in a way that's not just coherent, but it's simple. So I don't have to do any heavy mental lifting and I feel safe inside of it. I feel like things are not only better now, but they're just gonna keep getting better. And don't you dare touch that. Don't you dare come anywhere near that, especially with your righteousness. So I get it. I get why people attack. I get why people are making comments on my videos saying that I'm listless and I have no energy as I'm making a video running 10 miles through the snow in heavy boots at the age of 50 and now less than two weeks. Clearly I have no energy. To them, I have no energy because they can't see what I'm doing. They can't see the facts of what's taking place right here in front of their eyes in this video. All they can see is that this is a threat to something that helps them make sense of the world, that makes them feel good, that makes them feel like they have meaning, and that helps them to feel safe, and that it's a challenge to the very foundation of their, their identity, their well-being. Because when we find these things that give us a feeling of safety, or of importance, or significance, or meaning, we identify them with them. We start to incorporate them into our identity because we're very vulnerable when we come across these things. Uh, because we're lacking meaning, we're lacking significance, we're lacking health or vitality, we're lacking something. And this thing comes along in our most vulnerable moment and we're told by the charismatic leader that it's the answer to everything that ails us. And this this feeling, this belief, this certainty from the group, from the tribe, from the leader, from the ideology, it makes things better because now suddenly we have meaning. Now suddenly we have significance. Now suddenly we have a path and things make sense. And the future is only going to be brighter than the past. So we now identify with that because this transformation happened or began in a very, very vulnerable time for us. So people don't just see my video as a video about a vegan diet or uh, the story of someone who's eaten a, a vegan diet for 20 years. They don't see that. They don't see it as a, an autobiography of sorts. They see it as a threat to their identity. 
not a description of my story. Uh, so it becomes very personal, and suddenly the video is about them. Uh, because if it's true, then everything that they're identifying with is wrong. And that's an intolerable uh, conclusion or an intolerable realization. And you'll, if you go through the comments on that first video in this series, you'll see someone saying, you must be lying, or you are lying, or why are you lying? Because th my truth completely unravels their belief system and therefore their identity. And that is the biggest threat that a human mind can experience the unraveling of one's identity. Uh, this is why people commit suicide even though their bodies are perfectly healthy. There's no threat to their physical body at all. They've got a long physical life ahead of them with unlimited possibilities, but yet their identity has been shattered somehow and life egoistically becomes intolerable and it must end. And inside the ego narrative, uh, it has already ended. Now I just need to end the suffering and the misery, even though the physical body is not experiencing any misery most of the time. Some suicides are brought on by people that are in extreme physical pain. That does happen, and that is incredibly unfortunate. But for the rest, it's not physical at all. It's the ego narrative. And it's about that that ego has somehow been disrespected or diminished or demeaned in such a, a way that it can never be repaired. And people will fight, kill, or kill themselves over these types of wounds. Uh, and we see this in religious wars. We see this in political wars. Uh, it's not just right and left. It's my identification versus your identification. It's me versus you. It's no longer ideas. Because the ideas are now identified with. They're embodied. They are the keystones of our very beings. And I will protect them at all costs, even if it means lying, cheating, killing, stealing, whatever. It doesn't matter. So, when I see these comments, uh, and I get over my initial hair raising on the back of my neck, am I wanting to fight? Or embarrassment sometimes, because they're calling me out on things. Not legitimate things, but things about my physical being. For instance, his eyes are sunken. His cheeks are sunken. He's unhealthy. The diet is, is not working. Well, look at pictures of me from when I was a little kid. No, no, when I turned into an adult. When my bone structure changed, probably at the age of 13 or 14. And I remember looking in the mirror and the, the little boy with blonde hair and chubby cheeks was transforming into a young man with brown hair and really strong bone structure in his face. And my brow ridge kept getting thicker and thicker and my, my nose became more and more prominent and my cheeks became more and more narrow. And I watched this happen as a young adult and it was horrifying to, to witness this transformation. That cute boy was, was being consumed by this monster. And people used to call me Skeletor because of my strong bony features in my face. And this is when I was eating tons of meat and drinking a gallon of milk a day. Uh, and so these, these features of my physical being have been a source of great pain for me throughout my life because I would get picked on on a regular basis, especially for my nose and for my brow ridges and deep set eyes and people called me Neanderthal and I was picked on relentlessly. So uh, I this is one of, not the, but one of the reasons that 
depression became a, a regular feature of my life. Uh, is that I thought I was one of the ugliest human beings on the planet Earth. And that there was no hope for anyone ever accepting me or loving me. Uh, and that started a, a very dark road for me that didn't end until my mid to late 30s. And it's only really now, as my 40s are coming to a close, that I am mostly fully at peace with myself physically. So, when somebody makes those comments about my cheeks and my sunken eyes, it's not something that I can immediately dismiss because I've got a whole neural architecture that was built decades ago uh, that immediately brings up shame and self-loathing and fear and unworthiness, uh, freak, uh, freakiness. So that uh, boom, that rises in me, and I have to deal with that. So it's not just that I'm reacting like, oh, these are idiots. They're pushing my button. And if they watch this video, I've now given them that button. I've outlined it, I've defined it, I show them exactly where it is and how hard to push. But where I am now in my life, that's okay, go push it. I deal with that on a regular basis, that's my process. Push my button, I don't care. That's my homework for the day, to work with that button after it's been pushed. That's, that's my job right now. I don't know if the wind is too harsh here, it's really picking up, so I'm gonna try to run backwards for a little bit. But, uh, so I have that reaction. And secondly, my facial features have nothing to do with my diet. Those facial features were born in the midst of heavy meat and dairy consumption. Heavy! Uh, I hated vegetables. I did not eat fruits. I was a meat eater if there ever was one. And whenever we went out to dinner, it was always cheeseburgers. That's it. That's all I wanted. And I would often get rid of the buns and just eat the meat and cheese. So, the comments come. And they're clearly ignorant. But they're coming from human beings. And because I've studied so much psychology, I know, as I just talked about, why they're coming. Uh, and why they keep coming in rapid su succession. Because somebody is threatened and therefore somebody is sharing it and somebody is saying, we need to shut this down. This guy's talking sense. They don't say that consciously. But unconsciously, they, they see it as a real threat. Otherwise, they wouldn't show up. If it wasn't threatening to them, if it wasn't a compelling argument, they'd leave it alone. It wouldn't be worth bothering with. Uh, just like when the whole raw food world fell apart. I think it was in 2013, the Woodstock Fruit Festival, when certain people were demoted and they went on a campaign to assassinate the characters of everybody else involved with the festival. And anybody that they saw with a compelling argument or with a big audience, they would just unleash their tr their troll armies on and just engage in smear campaigns and lies and ad hominem attacks endlessly uh, because their identities were wounded so deeply and they hadn't learned ever how to deal with that. They didn't know how to deal with an attack to their identity or what they perceived as an attack. And it turned the whole vegan, raw YouTube world upside down and it still hasn't recovered yet. It, it sent it into a recession that changed it permanently. Uh, and it's starting to bounce back and we're getting, beginning to see some really interesting channels come out of the ashes, but they did an enormous amount of damage, uh, all while claiming to be the biggest advocates for veganism the biggest uh, voices in the vegan world. And if you go back to my original video, whoa, oh, oh, I slipped. Uh, vegan without compassion is an oxymoron, or it's pointedly foolish if you look at the definition of 
oxymoron. That's what it means to be pointedly foolish. Um, vegans that lack compassion are, are just fool, pointedly foolish. So, and the troll comments came then. And I got the same comments, the same attacks from these other vegans and raw vegans. Oh, his, his cheeks are sunken. He, his eyes are sunken. He, he's got gray hair. His teeth are falling out. And it wasn't because I wasn't eating meat. Uh, it was because I wasn't eating their style of Rachel 4 or whatever the, the program they were trying to sell at that time. So it's, it's always the same stuff. And it's happened so often now that I recognize it immediately. And it, it's never about truth. It's always about protection. And because my goal now is always compassion, I look at them as human beings and not trolls. And my process, which is based on a lot of it is based on the teachings of Chogyong Trumpa Rinpoche. Uh, not the, not a perfect man, definitely a human being. But I love his, his philosophies and his tools and the distinction he makes between compassion and idiot compassion. Idiot compassion is not compassion at all. It's, it's empathy that turns into cowardice. Where, oh, somebody's suffering... So let's remove all the obstacles around them. Uh, let's just make their life so easy so that they can remain fragile. We'll just, we'll keep them fragile. We'll do the work. We'll smooth out the world because we can handle it. I can handle this stuff. So don't worry, you don't have to. It's idiot compassion and we just set people up to continually fail. But his uh, idea of compassion or or his principles of crazy wisdom uh, is that compassion is tough compassion is hard compassion is honest and compassion is not hopeful nor delusional it's grounded and it says hey wake up take a look around look at what you're doing look at who you are feel what you're feeling get present I'm going to get in there with you and if you're open to this I'm going to help you get present and we're going to really take inventory of what is going on in the actual moment and what is going on in the trajectory that you're creating in your life and what is going on inside of your narrative what are you protecting what are you holding on to what are you addicted to what identity components are you addicted to and if they're taken away, the whole thing comes toppling down. So in this sense, compassion is not simply about being kind and gentle. It's about being kind, which means uh, acknowledging commonality. It's acknowledging that we're human. And humans are biological beings. They eventually die. They feel pain. They're ultimately not in control. They don't fully understand things. They can't predict the future. And they suffer on a regular basis. Uh, and it's built like that. It's not a mistake. It's not a glitch. It's not a hard drive virus. It's not an inner chimp. It's a feature of being human. Or should I say that is what it means to be human. Uh, and that's okay. It's We've gotten to where we are with this stuff. But now that we uh, have tools to better understand it, I think we can work more compassionately with it. So, crazy wisdom, or what they would call true compassion, is firm. And it's like, do you want out of this or not? If you want out of this, I will get in there with you, and we will touch the ground, we will dig through the dirt, we will get dirty, it'll get ugly, and we will move small things one at a time with effort in the midst of challenge, in the midst of pain, in the midst of fear, but we will make progress and eventually we will transform the situation and we will transform you. 
and it will be real and you will have skills and you will build a sense of self-efficacy. If you're willing to do that, I am your champion and I will fight for you. I will fight with you, not against you. But if you're not willing to do that, there's nothing I can do. And it pains me, but I have to walk away. And if you keep showing up in my life, I will offer you the same bargain. And if you continually refuse it, I will continually walk away. Uh, so with these people that are leaving the comments, if you look in the comment section, I've responded to some of them, and there's no way I can keep up, but I respond to some, and what I try to do is to ask questions. I try to engage them. I ask them why they're leaving these comments. What, are, what evidence are they based on? Uh, what is their agenda? Because uh, I, I really do want to know. I want to get to the bottom of it, not just for my curiosity, but hopefully to help them feel a little bit of curiosity of their own. I don't yell at them. I don't attack them. I don't call them names. I ask them questions, and my questions are often very firm. And my questions are often uh, very honest. And some people may see that as harsh, but honesty is honesty. Uh, and if they really want to, to get a closer or better understanding of the dynamics of things, then the only way to get there is through conversation. Um, but if they just want to spout ideology, I'm going to keep pointing that out by asking questions. And if they can't answer those questions or unwilling to, or continually evade them, I'll keep pointing that out. And then eventually I will walk away from the conversation. Because they're not interested in truth. They're not interested in growth. They're only interested in protecting something that they feel not only has been transformative, but it's the only way that one can transform. It is the only path. And if it's not the only path, they'll have doubt. And doubt is unacceptable. Uncertainty is unacceptable. Um, but I'm training myself to be a warrior of sorts in that regard. Come at me, swing at me, call me what you will. I'll have my reactions, but I'll be compassionate with them. And then I'll ask you questions and I won't run away. I will be firm and I will stand for you, not against you. You are not my enemy. You're not a meat eater. You're not an idiot. You're not a troll. You're a human being who needs to feel significant and needs to believe that there's some meaning. He needs to believe that the path that they're on is the right one. And I stand for you uh, as a human being, not as someone who ideas with, identifies with an ideology, but I stand for you as a human being that has that as a component. And if you want to engage in a, a mature conversation, have at it, Hoss. Okay. I'm going to leave it there. Hope there's something of value in there. And uh, I'll see you in the comments section. <laughs>